Hi everybody, I'm Al Rochelle. Thank you for joining us. We continue learning more about dysautonomia, specifically talking this time about autonomic medicine and neurology. My guest is Dr. Chris Gibbons. Doctor, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start out by talking a little bit about you. Give me about some of your background, your education, and what you're involved in right now. Sure, so I'm a neurologist and I'm based at Harvard Medical School in Boston and uh, my specialty is in autonomic disorders. So I've had a, a many year experience now thinking about kind of treating patients with autonomic disorders and a range of them, anywhere from things like diabetic autonomic neuropathy uh, to adults with a variety of degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease or multiple system atrophy mm -hmm. to a variety of symptomatic problems uh, with that postural tachycardia or autonomic neuropathies. So a whole range of autonomic disorders. Now, now, when did we actually start building what I would call a database of knowledge about autonomic medicine in general? Is that, is that we're talking 50, 60 years, or is it relatively new in the terms of the medical business? So if you're really interested in historical fiction and, and information about this, so if for those of you who are ever involved in track or running, one of the, uh, the, the most famous people is Sir Roger Bannister, who is the first individual who, to break the mile four-minute mark. Right, yeah. And so Sir Roger Bannister actually was probably one of the first and most famous autonomic neurologists. So the, the very, very interesting story about that is the day he broke the four-minute mile, he actually went then back to the lab to conduct his ongoing research in autonomic disorders. So this has been something that's been going on for many, many decades, but yeah. I think largely in very small numbers. So so he had dysautonomia? Or? No, no, he was a specialized neurologist in autonomic disorders. Oh, okay. So, uh, so essentially he was both famous for his work in the field of autonomic disorders and also famous for his work in breaking the four minute mile. Yeah, yeah, which I haven't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people have done it still yet. So let's talk about something we had talked about in some other, other segment called autonomic neuropathy. Uh, explain to me what that is. So that's really just a description saying a nerve damage problem specifically affecting the nerves that uh, go to the autonomic organs and so that the structures and the function that relates to that. So for example, um, sweat function or bowel function or bladder function, these are all autonomic controlled organs and the nerves that go to them. So an autonomic neuropathy would really be damage to those specific nerves mm -hmm. and largely in the peripheral nervous system. So we talk about the central nervous system, which is the brain in the spinal cord, and then once the nerves leave that area, that's the peripheral nervous system, and that's generally where these autonomic nerves are damaged in an autonomic neuropathy. It's interesting because the word neuropathy, we've heard it a lot lately, mostly because people figured out how to make money off of it, and they usually <laughs> talk about neuropathy, and mm -hmm. the first thing the consumer thinks of is, oh, my feet, my feet, that's the mm -hmm. first part of it. But are these neuropathies the kind of things that destroy uh, the nerve endings, or are these things that damage them, or do they numb them, and what, what happens? So, you, so you're absolutely right in describing it that way because these, they're doing similar things to different nerve types. And if it's hitting a sensory nerve, for mm -hmm. example, and the most common example of that would be diabetic neuropathy, uh, where the sensory nerves are damaged and they lose the ability to sense or feel in their feet first, and it might be painful or burning. They also have autonomic neuropathy that goes along with that, in which case they lose control of the peripheral autonomic nerves. They can lose control of blood pressure and sweat function. And and so these are autonomic nerves that are damaged in the same process, in the same way. Uh -huh. Do they cascade, like if you have one neuropathy that begins, that it can cascade into multiple neuropathies? Well, it doesn't necessarily spread from one disease to another, but yeah. generally a, a disorder that affects one nerve will, in fact, affect the other. Um, some may be more sensory predominant, so it's more sensory. Some may be more autonomic predominant. Um, and there's a bit of a back and forth, but most of the patients that we see will have a little bit of both. Um, some may be more heavily weighted, but that's often why they're very confusing to mm -hmm. a lot of physicians because this picture, the presentation that occurs, is very different different depending on what nerve is damaged. Does it get, <laughs> clinically does it get worse? In other words, you may have started this and you wondered what the symptoms were, but then, then clinically it does actually get worse to the point that when you come into a doctor, it's like, it isn't just a minor thing, it's something that's really affecting my life. Exactly, and that's unfortunately what we're really trying to identify early, is if we can identify the underlying problem, maybe we can treat it and prevent it to 
from getting to that issue. Okay, so how do we get to that point where we identify those underlying symptoms, if you want to call them that? Yeah, so, so an example today, actually we talked about in some of our earlier Autonomic Society sessions, uh, was the concept of amyloidosis. And so this is a protein disorder where an abnormal protein in people who have a hereditary form of this disease, it accumulates in the body in various places. Mm -hmm. may affect the heart, may affect the nerves, but as it accumulates over time, it damages these systems and causes more and more disease. However, there are several new treatments that have come out that halt the progression of this protein and stop the disease in its tracks, which really is, is you know, that's a miracle you exactly yeah. for these patients, which is incredible. And that's the type of thing we're hoping to reproduce across different diseases. So under you know, kind of defining the underlying disease is really critical because that's the first step in the road to, to a treatment. Now, do all neurologists know what you know? No, I don't mean specifically that you know, because obviously you've been doing a lot of research, but in terms of what we're trying to do with these videos is to let other neurologists know that, hey, these are things you might be want to look for. So I think largely the answer is no. Unfortunately, the autonomic nervous system is typically considered almost a black box of medicine. Um, it's, it's a number of different confusing symptoms yeah, that yeah. occurs at the, and that are difficult to decipher um, to the, the person who has not had a lot of familiarity or training in the system. So it does get very confusing, and I think that's largely one of the biggest challenges to treating these types of disorders. Well, when you said black box, boy, you described it really well because people don't understand it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the these neuropathies as, as it relates to uh, age groups. Is it different for, for each age group? Uh, it is actually strikingly so. So you may have very young, you know, pediatric patients who have hereditary disorders. And these are people who have inherited an abnormality or acquired a mutation that results in a bad disease very early in life. And so they may have a degeneration of the autonomic nervous system starting at birth and progressing. Oh and many of these kids really, you know, won't make it out of childhood. Um, so the, these are terrible diseases. Um, but those are sort of, they're quite rare, and, and I would say that's not a common presentation, but that's clearly an area of concern in early life. Yeah. And then as people go into later life, teenage and beyond, that's when we start to acquire diseases. So people might develop, say, type 1 diabetes, or they might develop amyloid or other disorders that, that come on top of a, a normal functioning person and start to create these challenges. And then as we move into later life, that's when we start to see what we call neurodegenerative disorders. Mm -hmm. And that would be your Parkinson's disease or your autonomic failure syndromes that result in damage to the autonomic nervous system. So, but there really are discrete periods of, of life where certain disorders occur and are most likely. Wow. Uh, so one of the things we're trying to do is we're, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something that might be kind of difficult. If, what is your message to a neurologist right now? If there was one thing that you said, if you walk away from this video and you remember one thing, and this is what I want you to remember, that's for physicians, and we'll talk about patients. So I think you know the one thing to try and stress is that there are some basic principles with this that are are, are uh, capturable and understandable, digestible, if you were, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, and that's the important part. This is challenging but not impossible to understand, and being willing and taking the time to learn this. Absolutely, you can become very familiar with the process. And for patients, because I know this is this is a rough road for people. And I think the biggest challenge for patients, and, and this has been the biggest complaint both for us and for, you know, largely for the medical community at large, is finding the right person who can help them through their disease process. And I think what you want to start with is, you know, running through the usual path through your primary care doctor to make sure it's not some obvious, you know, problem that you're exhibiting. Right. But once you're sort of at that stage, then being able to refer on to somebody who has experience with autonomic disorders. And we have autonomic disorder training programs. The number of specialists is gradually increasing. So it is helpful. But again, it's still challenging. But there are centers that are around the country that are available and people can, can absolutely be seen in. So these are places that you can really seek, seek help. Well, that's great because there are millions of people that are affected by this that don't even know it. Doctor, thank you so much for your information. It's been very helpful. Really you're very welcome. It. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.